Hi, this is Talia, and welcome to Talia Nerds Out. I had meant to do this recording um, quite a bit earlier, but got a migraine for Christmas. Well, day after Christmas, so it didn't happen until now. Um, let me turn up the lighting a little bit. I guess that's up all the way. Let's do this one. Okay, I hope that doesn't blow things out too much. Okay, so um, I just wanted to show some books that I got for Christmas and prior to Christmas, following some of the same theme that you've been seeing, but um, yeah, I just wanted to show some book related things. Actually, the first thing is not a book. These are bookmarks. These came from, I have, and I should have brought them over. Maybe I'll get up and get them, but these are um, bookmarks. I have a um, uh, someone I know who is a knit designer. There we go. And she and her husband put out these children books. And her shop is Slate Falls, Slate Falls Press. She had it's SlateFallsPress.com. She's also on Etsy. Her husband does the artwork. They write these cute little stories. And in the back, there are the knitting patterns. Like, uh, I think that, yeah, Henry here has a hat. So he's not wearing it right now. But Phoebe's sweater... I also have the one with the platypus, which is his blanket. Um, are my books easy to reach? I can't remember where I actually put them. Um, but yeah, beautiful books. Maybe I'll show them another time. I think they're somewhere back there. But those are bookmarks that I got. She sent them free with the um, with the books. And then, oh, also her little business card, which I might put in my junk journal. There we go. Henry's hat. My mom picked up these awesome bookmarks for me. These are Poe inspired bookmarks. So unthought like thoughts that are the souls of thought. Um, they all, also stupidity is a talent for misconception. That's that bunch. Let's see. Then let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Stay positive. Let's see, I'm trying to find the ones that oh, this one goes with this. Okay. Oh, I think, did I say this one already? Yes. So I'm trying to put the same ones together. So that way I actually know where things are. Oops. Did that one. Okay. Then. Okay. Words have no power to impress the mind without the exqu exquisite horror of their reality. No problem. Oh no. Cool story, Poe. When it rains, it poes. Some of these are quite terrible. <laughs> yes, I'll be using these in most of my books. All I loved, I loved alone. Believe nothing you hear and only one half that you see. That makes me think a little bit of the Bilbo quotes about, um, I know, let's see, I, I know half of you, I have as well as I should, and, oh, bless, it's in the Hobbit. I can't bring it to mind right now. They were trying to think of whether or not he was insulting them. Okay, uh, let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore, oh, I think I did this one, yeah. And stay popped positive on the other side. So yeah, I think I did that one. And the fa last one. Keep calm and follow your telltale heart. Pull me a cup. So awesome, punny, po bookmarks. These are great. I spent a fair amount of time instead of opening presents. 
sorry about the twinkling, looking at my Poe bookmarks. I need to find a better place to keep my bookmarks so these don't get lost. Okay. Then I do, in fact, have a book stash. This was a Christmas present. Urge to Kill. How Police Take Homicide from Case to Court. Now this actually, although this is um, focused on specific cases and forensic um, history, this comes from a series of actually Writer's Digest books. And my mom happens to have some of the other ones. I didn't realize that when I asked for it for Christmas. Um, so this one is talking about homicide to court, so like it's forensics. Haven't read it yet, but then you have How Done It. I think my mom has that one or had that one. How Crimes Are Committed and Solved. Um, Deadly Doses, A Writer's Guide to Poisons. I know my mom had has that one. Criminal Mind, I'm not sure if she has that one. I know she had Cause of Death, A Writer's Guide to Death, Murder, and Forensic Medicine. So she had the two definitely that said Writer's Guide on it. So yeah, I didn't realize this was in a writer series. That makes sense. But I think it's still going to be good for actual reading, not just for someone who's looking to write. I don't generally write this kind of stuff. A little bit I do write. But I do find the topic interesting. Okay, then... This one, I think this is Janelle's fault. I'm pretty sure this is Janelle's fault. Quite a while back, uh, I believe it was Janelle from Two Fonda Books mentioned this book that she found, uh, True Story, Murder at the Met. I had been waiting for it to come down at price at Thrift Books, and eventually did. It's not available on Kindle or anything that I could tell. So it is... Um, the true story of, I think they call, it's called the, okay, based on the exclusive accounts of the detectives Mike Strzok and Jerry Giorgio of how they solved the Phantom of the Opera case. So that alone sounds interesting. That's really what I remember most about it is that it was called the Phantom of the Opera case. I haven't read anything about it other than that little bit. Oh, I forgot what my stash. Let me go grab that book. I will probably cut out that part of me getting up. Oh, this chair's new, too, because I have a habit of falling asleep in my chair, and I fell once because of that. Okay, so this is Henry's Hat. That's the book I was telling you about. It's meant for children, but honestly, I love the artwork so much and patterns that I am going to pick up the whole set, even though I have no children. Look at that. Beautiful artwork. Oh, look. There is them in the pantry. Family dinner. Oh, I want the one where they're doing football. And like I said, the patterns are in the back. Oh, I saw that. that was the one that was on the gift card, on the um, business card. This is the one. All the animals playing football. Looks like our guy, uh, Henry, in the letter sweater, he's doing just fine. Then this one, I'm actually knitting the platypus from this. I'm almost at the point where I can start doing his beak. And these are signed copies. Um, Joanna, make sure that you can get them signed if you want to. These have just some absolutely adorable pictures in them. And like I said, her husband does the artwork. And isn't that adorable Mama uh, Platypus's knitting? Probably knitting his blankets. This is absolutely amazing. You might hear a door in the background. My dad, oh no, my sister's probably coming out in from being outside. If I, like, I could easily show you all of these. I think the last one I'll show you is that one. So 
So these are just absolutely precious. Like I said, I'm knitting the platypus pattern from this. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's an easy picture that doesn't give away the pattern. But I don't want to show the pattern on here. Let's see. So that's the platypus that I'm knitting. So just very lovely. I've knit her patterns before. I have a sweater, a sweater and a sweater. So it's like a shawl sweater. I've knit two, a, that sweater and the sweater of hers. Um, the sweater was in of Green Gables inspired and the sweater was um, Little Women inspired. This was sent to me by a friend. She saw that I, whoops. Sorry, guys. You just fell right out of my reach. Come back here. I also have, oh, I need to find where I put those. I have my Little Women one and my, I knew I had more of these. I'll have to find where I put Little Women and where I put, um, I don't have Sherlock Holmes in physical. I have Little Women in physical and I have Anna Green Gables in physical. I thought, I have to go find them and see if I do. Anyway. I know I have the digitals because I've made the Diana's hat like 20 million times. So th my friend saw that I've had this book on my wish list for a long time. And I guess a family member sent her a box of books. And when she saw this book, she thought of me and she just sent it to me. This is The Radium Girls, the dark story behind America's Shining Women. I had actually first heard about this story, you know, the basic idea of this story on, I forget which podcast it was. I think it was a podcast, not a documentary. Maybe it was Greg Corsett's class. I don't know. I heard about this somewhere. I know I listened to it. And the story is heartbreaking, and I immediately wanted to read the book as soon as I heard the basics of the story. So I just kept it, you know, as something that I would eventually read. So she very kindly sent me this book. It's amazing. There's also at the end a um, reading group guide. So it has like questions. Not only would it be good for a reading group, um, I think it would be good if you were doing like high school homeschooling. You could then, um, I'm trying to find the questions. Ah, there it is. So it's, you know, towards the end, it's not a whole lot of questions. But what I'm thinking of as book report prompts or um, just some sort of report writing prompts for the high school level, because I think this might be a little too intense for younger kids. And I think it would just be a great learning experience because this is an interesting story, um, an important story, because it brought about important legislation for protecting workers. Um, and, yeah, it's not something that you learn a lot about when you're in school. So I think this would be a great high school um, book report, maybe even, I think of it maybe more high school, es especially for homeschoolers who so they're building their own thing. Uh, I was homeschooled, so I know that you can really use pulling from different sources, and when you do that, you can learn a, a whole time. But yeah, I am really excited about looking into this, and maybe I will look at the questions at the end afterwards. But yeah, thank you, Brittany. I'm looking forward to this. Then next, um, these, okay, this one first. Let me show that. I've been wanting this for a while um, because I, from what I understand, you get part of the picture when you read Tolkien's books, but his letters are really <clears throat> important to understanding the legendarium, or at least the story that goes untold. These are letters that are um, between him and fans, where fans are asking him questions, and he's answering, like, did the Ents ever find the Ent wives? Or, um, I, that's the one that immediately comes to mind. So this covers those things that fans would want to know, but that were not ever covered, which I find absolutely interesting. And as you can see, this is quite thick with small text. And I do look forward to reading this. 
so there's that. Um, okay, these next are absolutely 100% Janelle's fault. Okay, maybe only one of them is 100% uh, Janelle's fault. No, they're all Janelle's fault, I'm going to say. This one is definitely Janelle's fault. She mentioned, whoops, that's upside down. Janelle mentioned that um, something about either she borrowed or she has the Agatha Christie who's who. And if you read Agatha Christie, or even if you read Sherlock Holmes, you're always hearing about them pulling out the who's who and looking up the important people. I was really interested in this because it's supposed to go over every character and you can just sort of reference back to characters. You know where they came from. This can be interesting if you forgot characters' names and were trying to remember who they were. So it's really just built like a normal who's who. Um, they'll tell you, okay, yeah, well, this person, uh, if they were married, they'll tell you what their name uh, became, you know, what the name was after they got married, or what their name was before they got married, and also, of course, their married name. Um... So yeah, it's just a nice basic idea of who each of the characters are. Just enough so you... Oh, that's fun. I guess each letter has a little picture. Just so you have an idea of who you're working with. And it has like, like random little sketches throughout. Um, let's see. One that's... Well, that's another one on here. B... And let me see. Oh, well, here at the end, here's the cyanide uh, from sparkling cyanide, I'm assuming. And then here's one where there's a random picture in the middle of the text. So I'm looking forward to just sort of having this on hand, you know, just flipping through when I want to. Because I've read most of the books, it's not really a problem. But it's just a fun thing to have, just to cross reference. But there's the who's who. I'm just going to put it back here where this belongs. Because I have a, right behind y'all is my Agatha Christie collection. Oh, speaking of which, I had the, I don't think I showed this last time. I could only find the um, Hercule Poirot's Christmas alone as a single story on Kindle. But I could never find the set. I did find the physical form, and I went ahead and picked it up partially because this cover is gorgeous. And I had this before Christmas. And the inside looks like this. It has in it, of course, the titular, The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding. Then you also have The Mystery of the Spanish Chest, The Underdog, Four and Twenty Blackbirds, the Dream and Greenshaw's Folly. Um, I actually, if I've read any of these other short stories before, I don't remember them. So this was kind of cool to explore, all, besides the adventure of the Christmas pudding, these other short stories. Okay. This is interesting. Agatha Christie's Secret Notebooks includes two unpublished Poirot stories. And from what I understand, they have even... Un they have unused ideas and like endings that were not used. Oh, sketches. So this is really cool. Um, not only as a reader, but as someone who enjoys the writing process, even though I'm nowhere near as serious. So this is quite fun. And then the next one is um, Agatha Christie Murder in the Making. So uh, this one includes two unpublished Poirot stories. This one here includes an unseen Miss Marple story, which I find exciting. Um, and, you know, it's along the same vein. Um, I think it has, yeah, notes, ideas that she decided to go with. Again, another sketch. So I'm really, yeah, I'm really excited about reading these. Um, I, one of the booktubers I watched... Maybe it wasn't Janelle. Maybe it's Chantel. Chantel reads all day? Maybe? One of the ones who was trying to solve at, uh, at the Christie novels for a while. I think she was the one who mentioned um, these books and that she 
would, after she finished reading the book, she would go and find that particular story in the secret notebooks and then read the notes on it. I just finished reading, rereading, um, Murder Roger Ackroyd. So I will go and find Murder Roger Ackroyd in the notebook and then I'll read that. I do know that that happened during a very, right before a very turbulent time period in life. It came out around the time her mother died and then right after it came out, her, yeah, I think it came out after, no, before all that because they thought her disappearing was a publicity stunt. Some people claim but um, this book, uh, Murder Roger Ackroyd, was also uh, right before her husband uh, revealed that he was cheating on her and he wanted to leave her. So it was a very turbulent time period in her life, a lot going on, but one, considered widely one of her best books. I forgot to show the inside there. I wonder if the other one's the same. No, the other one, okay, the other one's fun. Ooh, this is raised. Can you guys see? That's raised. Nice texture. It also has a um, an inscription, when I, which I love when they have this. Maybe I'm weird, but I feel like it makes it feel a little more special to have library cards, inscriptions. It feels like being connected to someone, whoever it was who owned this book in the past. Especially if it doesn't affect the actual writing. I don't care if there's like a to so-and-so from so-and-so or a library card. I just don't want writing in the actual text. But yeah, looking forward to these. Um, I'm rebuilding some of my ooh, notes. Some of my things that I used to have, but trying to get, you know, not as many of the paperbacks. I like hardcovers. This one is an omnibus. It has um, Murder Roger Ackroyd, and then there were none. A uh, witness for the prosecution, and what now I'm rereading Death on the Nile. I did watch for the first time the other day the Death on the Nile um, with Suchet. And even though they combine characters, which is not my favorite thing, I usually actually hate it when they combine characters. I didn't like the combining characters, but I could understand why they did it, and I thought they did it well. Um, I love the actress who played um, Jackie. I think she was absolutely perfect. So was um, the actress who, oh, she's now really well known, um, who played Lynette. Um, she also played in um, Devil Wears Prada. She was the original first secretary. Um, she's played in a lot of different things. Um, she's married to the guy from The Office, um, Jim. But I can't remember her actual name. But she plays Lynette, and I think, thought she was perfect as Lynette. That's exactly, actually, it's very close to the way I pictured Lynette and always have. So I thought she was an amazing choice. I thought Jackie was an amazing choice. She fit what I saw in my head. Um, I thought, I don't know why I can't pull the guys out. The book's right in front of me. Um, I thought that, um, I want to say his, I want to say his name was, She says it. Simon. Simon was perfect. They're, they just did an amazing job with casting. Especially of that main three. Which you really do have to get right to make the movie feel right. So, amazing casting choices. They generally did do amazing casting choices for the Suche movies. The, I actually did really enjoy this version. I wish they had let... Um... I wish they'd let Rosalind, I think her name was Rosalind, uh, keep the ending the, the way they wrote, wrote it in the book. It wasn't a huge change, but I was kind of sad they didn't let it stay. And um, even though I understand why they did it, 
it did change things not to have the nurse who was barely a character. Um, her being there did affect things, though. Because it made, um, her name was Cecilia, the young um, American ladies, it made her relationship with the doctor make less sense because she wasn't there to help him with Simon's injury. Instead, because the nurse wasn't there, like she was in the book, um, I'm just going to call her Cecilia because I can't remember her name. She was sitting instead with Jackie. Um, oh, Cornelia, excuse me. Cornelia Robinson. So, because Cornelia was with Jackie, she, you don't see why she's getting close to the doctor because you miss that time period where she's really getting close to him. Um, and then they combined the British lawyer, because there were two of Lynette's solicitors there in the book. There is the American one who was a bit um, shifty, and then you had the British one, the young British guy who was supposed to be kind of making sure that the American didn't slip anything over on Lynette while Lynette was on her honeymoon. That wasn't going to happen. Lynette was too good of a businesswoman. But um, originally in the book, he was there for the whole, like, Simon's been shot, let's go get the doctor circumstance. Not the um, uh, not the guy who was a socialist. I, now, I understand for movie purposes why they combined those characters because the lawyer, the young British lawyer, he was kind of a mild character. Although he had his part to play, I can see that maybe they might say, well, what he does could easily be done by this other character. That being said, I do miss the young lawyer. Part of why Cornelia got close to the doctor again was the two things happened. Because um, they don't really explain why, um, they don't really make clear for it to be in character why the um, socialist leaves the lounge when Jackie and um, and Simon start having their loud argument when Jackie's drunk. They don't, he don't, they don't want to explain why, because he's not really a character in himself who's going to like run away from the sound conflict for, or from noisy argument. Whereas you have that y young British lawyer, and he actually was very uncomfortable. And so he left Cornelia there, and he just went outside, and um, I think he was smoking outside. Uh, the, the little lounge area on um, on the uh, boat they were on, on the cruise boat, whatever. Um, but because you had this kind of reserved character who got very, kind of, I guess, overwhelmed easily, um, certain things happened. So first of all, it made sense for him to leave that room because he, the noise and the emotion made him very uncomfortable. Cornelia would have left if uh, Jackie had let her, but Jackie didn't let her leave. Um, but the other thing where the lawyer was important, probably the main thing that the lawyer was important for, was the doctor initially wanted him to help pull out the bullet. And in the movie, you see the socialist help with pulling out the bullet and helping with Simon. Um, because it wouldn't that would have fit with his character if you managed to rope him into it. In the book... Because you had the young lawyer who gets kind of overwhelmed easily. He starts turning green. <laughs> so Cornelia takes over. And that's when you start seeing the doctor develop respect for her. She starts to gain a little bit more self-confidence. So it was a bit, these small characters, the nurse and then this young British lawyer, they were actually very important for the development of, well, mostly the Cornelia character um, and her relationship. Now, in the long run for the movie... Was it terribly important? No. If you were going to change something, I understand why that was changed, and it didn't mar my enjoyment of the movie. I think it is an excellent representation of Death on the Nile. Um, I honestly can't see how it could have been better done. And, uh, yeah, I'm not usually one who enjoys the books made into movies because a lot of times they change things drastically. <laughs> Cards on the table. <laughs> um, but this one was well done and well within the spirit that Agatha Christie intended it to be. Um, but yeah, that is my other stash. I think I have a few more things coming in for stash. Um, I am going to get off of here because I don't know if it's the weather coming in or if I'm trying to work on another migraine, but I usually get neck discomfort with it. I'm starting to develop that, so I want to turn on the lights a little bit. 
But yeah, thank you for joining me if you've managed to last through. I'm really looking forward to these books. I'm hoping eventually to go more into the things I've read. Um, but I know that I did have thoughts about Mansfield Park. I ended up writing that in an, a blog post, but maybe eventually I'll be putting that into a video. But yeah, um, that's it for me for now. Hope that you enjoyed a little look into what I have now got. I'm going to put these things away. And uh, yeah, I will see you next time. Oh, almost forgot. Almost forgot the writer's thesaurus. I have a, dic um, a dictionary coming in too. This is amazing. So what I like about this, more than a normal thesaurus, so it will tell you things like choose the right word. This is underneath include. Include, comprise. And then underneath in the box it says include has a broader meaning than comprise. In the sentence, the accommodations comprise two bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, living room. The word comprise implies that there are no accommodations other than those listed. Include can be used in this way too, but it can also be used in a non-restrictive way. So it's giving you all this reason, you know, why these two words should or should not be choose. And then it says careful writers will avoid superfluous uses of including and more, commonly found in advertising. The and more is superfluous because including or includes implies that there is more than what is listed. So that is just a really cool bit of writing tip. So that's alone made this worth it. Um, I had gotten my mom, who is really into writing, one of these. So I used some Christmas money to get this one for myself. And then I have, which I've been dying to have for a while, a um, an Oxford, I can't remember if I got an Oxford English Dictionary or an Oxford Dictionary of English, because there's two for some reason. Um, I got the one that looked like it had the most um, in the way of etymology and the most in the way of words. Because what I like to do is, although I sometimes do it on my app, I prefer to do it on a book. I usually have a classic book, say Poro, and I'll be reading and I'll find a word I don't know. Yeah, I can look it up on my phone, but I'd rather pull out a dictionary and do it. Well, this one's more for writing, but um, the, the other one, I'd rather pull out a dictionary and be like, okay, oh, that's what it means. Like the other day, I finally looked up Mountebank because, I mean, Poro is constantly being called Mountebank or being thought of as a Mountebank. And I had always thought it had something to do with his foreignness. But if you look it up, I do have the Oxford English Dictionary um, app. I just would prefer to have it on a book. Mount bank. Okay, so mount bank. A person who deceives others, especially in order to trick them out of their money. A charlatan. Um, and then what I really like about Oxford English Dictionary is it has the origin, which is from the 16th century. Um, but yeah, so I had always thought I had to do foreignness, but it actually just has to be with being a charlatan, which I thought was interesting. But when I look back, I can see, oh, okay, I can see how that use of it makes sense. The, the first time, well, maybe look it up, is in, I think it's the short story, The Dream, in um, the Hercule Poirot's Christmas collection. In that short story, Poirot actually thinks of another character as a mountebank, which I've never seen him do, which made me realize, oh, this isn't just a, oh, he's such a foreigner, you know, on the English's part. So I was like, okay, there's something else going on here. I need to look up his work. That's, that's the whole purpose. I want something like a dictionary nearby, because I don't always have to look it up on my phone. I like physical reference books. I haven't had a good one since, you know, high school. I think we probably got rid of the high school one and all that jazz. So I've always wanted an Oxford English Dictionary ever since I read the book about the um, guy who was a murderer who helped with the Oxford English Dictionary. And I can't remember the name of the book. I borrowed that one from the library on my Kindle. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. That is my stash. I'm hoping that, you know, after all the stuff comes in that I've had, you know, already ordered, 
I hope to slow down on my spending. Thrift books is kind of bad for me because they're really inexpensive. But, um, yeah, I do hope to slow down a bit. Anyway. Oh, I almost forgot to add, um, that... So, editing Talia here. I guess I almost forgot to add that with my... I think it was my Who's Who book. There came kind of a cool thing. So, I do a little bit of junk journaling. This is a junk journal I got for Christmas. But, they... I got... A little thing, this thing here, the Agatha Christie's Who Who Crossword Puzzle. So on the back it has the actual crossword puzzle, and it was, I think it was put together in 19, yeah, copyright 1980 by Randall Toy and Judith Hawkins Gaffney. So on the front it has the picture, it says Agatha Christie's Who Who Crossword Puzzle. Back it has a crossword puzzle. Made a little pocket out of the Thrift Books package. So that will stay in the book, and I don't actually tape down the actual crossword. There we go. So that goes in there. And I found a long time ago, I don't remember what I got this sticker from. It was thrown into an order. So, but it's basically, that's Poirot's mustache. And does they, ever, he has this thing that he says occasionally, particularly to Hastings. Murder is not a game. And this is usually when Hastings will say that something is, that it's not playing the game. Because... Either Poirot has listened at the doorway, you know, eavesdropped, or he has gone through someone's papers or some other thing that offends Hastings' uh, sensibilities of fair play. So I thought it was very appropriate to have Murder is Not a Game next to the crossword puzzle. Um, I made the game green because um, Poirot's eyes gleam green whenever he uh, gets an idea. But yeah, I, I did want to show that because that came with... That little insert came with my Who's Who book, which is really cool. And that is my first, like, real entry in that new journal, which is fun as well. Okay, so sorry about forgetting to do that in the main part. Maybe I could splice it in to look a little bit more natural. If not, you just have an addendum. Thank you very much for joining me for BookTube. Um, you have a great day. God bless. Bye.